someone told me, you know, you're paralyzed, you're going to be wheelchair for the rest of your life. I said, I don't believe in being paralyzed. And I can't argue with that. I mean, like, I'm currently in a wheelchair. I currently have a spinal cord injury. But no one can argue with the fact that, like, you don't have to stay paralyzed even if you can't move your body. One day I went to southern Utah, to St. George, and I'd never been there before. Didn't grow up here. Not familiar with that area, and so all the beautiful red rocks and the red sand and the red dirt, you know, sort of make everything blend together. And I was jumping on the tops of these boulders, jumping from one to the other to the other, until I saw this one last boulder, and I jumped for it. And on accident, I just jumped off a cliff. Well, I fell about 45 feet to the ground where they think I landed on hands and knees because they broke both my arms and both my legs, my collarbone, and then four bones in my neck. And they life flighted me to LDS Hospital in Salt Lake City where I was pronounced a quadriplegic paralyzed from my chest down without the use of my hands. There was no more walking and no more dancing. It was so awful and so terrible. I remember I woke up in the hospital. I started to cry, and the tears didn't have anywhere to go except for down the sides of my face and into my ears, you know. And I had tape on my nose with the feeding tube and tape on my mouth. I had the metal halo like screwed into my head, and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't like sit up or roll over. I was laying flat on my back, and so I was looking at the ceiling, and so I say in my heart, like, I love that ceiling. And then I looked at the window, and I said, I love that window and that car and that visitor's chair and the TV and I said I loved everything in the room and by the time I'd done that I was crying again only I was crying because I was so happy. I'd gone from being so sad to the point of tears to being so happy to the point of tears simply by loving everything that was around me and that was the moment that I knew that this was going to be okay. I could, I could still have a happy life even if it wasn't the life that I thought I wanted. The first thing I noticed after I got off the ventilator was that I couldn't hardly speak anymore, let alone laugh. I, like, it doesn't sound happy. When I laugh, it looks like I'm having a seizure because I'm not making any noise. <laughs> and then everybody stops laughing because it's not funny anymore. And I had the idea that if I wanted to get my laugh back, all I had to do was sing every day. And so from that day on, I started to sing. And um, now it's been 17 years later and when I laugh, you can hear me, not as good as I used to laugh, but it's coming, <laughs> it's coming, and I'm still singing. I know that you don't have to actually have lung damage to have laughter damage. This life has a way of damaging laughter for everybody. And I am a firm believer that the healing method that I use to get my laugh back works for everybody, that you can sing away bad things. There's trials on every single level. There's, there's no way that you could identify someone's trial by the way that they look because it just goes on and on and on in their life. People are struggling with like, currently the pandemic and isolation, uh, employment is a big deal, finances are always a struggle for some. Then there's things like hobbies you can't do, family you can't see. I feel like I get a lot of credit, a lot of sympathy for having a hard day, a hard life because I'm in a wheelchair, my hands don't work, like I'm paralyzed, you can see my scars. I, I walked for 22 years and I know that the hardest trials in this life don't even show up on the outside and people are dealing with a difficult battle in their heart every day. After I started to have kids and, and they started, I could see it in their faces, you know, that I was different. I can't do a lot of things that I would like to do with my kids and it hurts, it hurts bad to not be able to teach my kids how to dance, but I can find people who teach that. I can find people who teach them how to sing, but I have the big responsibility to teach them that they still do, that they still dance and they still sing, no matter what. And that's still an important job. My daughters sleep in bunk beds, and so it's hard to reach even down low, let alone reach up high. And then I, all I can do when we sing them to sleep is I just hold on to my daughter's hand up here because it's the best I can do, and no one asks for more than that, not even this life. This life doesn't ask for more than that. And if you can give life the best that you have, you've done the best that you can. And the best that I can do as a mom is be a really good mom in a different kind of way. No matter who we are, what we can or can't do, it's important to know that this life doesn't just go on. We can go on with it and it can be a fun one.